Tap, tap. Hey, welcome to um, Would You Like to Update Java? Everybody, thank you. This is, uh, I'm Zyba. This is a little math for your big ideas. Thank you all for coming so much to a uh, talk that had such little actual description in the program. Um, uh, for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to be given uh, a bit of a math lesson. Why would I think that's a good idea? Um, aside from it is going to be fun. Um, there are two audiences that I really want to try and reach uh, today and talk about this. Um, the first is, uh, the growing variety of game creators. Unity and all its democratization has brought in people from so many different backgrounds into games, and it's wonderful and I love it. People coming from uh, different cultures, languages, uh, professions, you know, artists, and they're taking more and more central roles in programming video games. Um, and I think that's super healthy for the industry. Uh, I myself have a bit more of a uh, traditional background through computer science and a bunch of math classes. Not that I remembered everything I was uh, uh, taught, but it gave me a lot of confidence that I know how. I did this in undergrad, I sort of remember, I have these ideas, I can implement them. And um, what I want to share is a, a sense with a lot of people who may feel that they are outsiders to being able to implement something that involves some math, um, that there are a lot of really simple things you can do um, and that you should dream bigger and include some of these ideas in what you, what you attempt to do. Uh, the other audience I'm hoping to, to, uh, to interest with this talk uh, is people who are interested in buoyancy, making things float. So I'm going to give some examples of how to use uh, some vector math, some very simple linear algebra, and I'm going to tie it along the way to the examples of making things float. A uh, bit about myself first. Uh, I'm Zyba. I also go by Pop Cannibal, local here to Boston. I make games. I work with local artist Luigi. Uh, we made uh, Girls Like Robots. Elegy for a Dead World, and now we're making Make Sail. Uh, and this game is actually what led me down this path to be worried about buoyancy and things, because it has a lot of floating stuff. We actually um, uh, spun off the uh, water physics in our game, uh, and we're selling it on the asset store, Water Volume Advanced Buoyancy, which is sort of a, is a crap name, but it's out there. Um, and uh, I really didn't want this talk to be an infomercial, so um, if any of you are interested in the code for all the water stuff we'll be talking about today, please just email me. I'll have my email later on the slides, um, and I'll, be, I'll send you a voucher for the asset store. Uh, if you want to play with the water at all, I'd love, love feedback on that. Okay, so here is our, uh, our syllabus, what we're going to be doing today in class. All right, so we're going to make things float, and we're going to make them drag in the water, but only the underwater parts of the objects. And we're going to account for the surface area of the objects when they're moving through water. We're going to do this on waves, and we're going to have a 1,000 of them. Um, and we're going to do this in the next 23 minutes. OK, so um, start real basic here. In Unity, the rigid body class which component which comes with it um, is really what's doing all the heavy lifting here. You get this on an object, and pow, physics, falling, tumbling, bouncing off each other, that plus some hit colliders. So a lot of what we're going to be doing today is applying some forces to existing Unity rigid bodies. All right, so, oh, I have a lot of gifts, so I, I was excited about that, nice moving things. All right. um, here is an uh, animation of an object falling down into water, and the water is doing nothing for it. So I have this white uh, vector here, you'll see this white arrow pointing down, and throughout this presentation, that's going to be the velocity of the object. So the velocity of this thing has shown that it's going straight down. So we know that when it hits the water, the most natural thing to do would be let's, let's have it go back up. I want to tell this to go back up. I want to talk to the rigid body and add a force to it. So rigid body dot add force. How do I communicate force in Unity? This is going to be vectors. Vectors. All right. What is vector? A vector is direction plus magnitude, easily confused with a position, and tremendously useful. So this is a position. All right, this may be su super basic. Don't be insulted. It gets a little bit more or something. But anyway, so this is uh, this blue point is at one, one to the right, one up, and zero in and out. There's nothing popping out of the screen. This is position one one zero. This is vector one one zero. It is the journey one to the right and the journey one up. It's not that position in space. All of these are vector one one zero because it's about a trip in a direction 
for a certain distance, um, where the point is just that specific spot in space. Even though they're both three numbers, um, and uh, th the same three numbers, they mean something different. Um, vectors have some cool properties, uh, very simple operations like, look at this one. You multiply it by two, and now it is a vector that goes twice as far in that same direction. It's pretty intuitive. Um, so like I said, it's easily confused with a point. Um, here's uh, the Unity documentation. It actually says that the Unity's Vector3 class is a representation of vectors and points. And you will see throughout your use of Unity, Unity's use and other people's use of it, that they interchangeably use this type, Vector3, both to hold positions in space and vectors, these direction plus magnitude combos. So I'm going to try and be clear today when I'm talking about a vector through whether I'm talking about a vector or a position. And that's something that uh, you want to be aware of when you're working with these things. OK, so now that I know I want to talk in vectors to my object that's falling into the water, um, I want to have it go up. So in Unity, y is up, the, the second, so x, y, z. So I'm going to make a new vector with 0, 20, 0 force. And that's, so that's straight up. And I'm going to apply it whenever my object gets underwater. So you can see on the right side, it goes under. My new blue buoyancy line is pulling it right back up. And then it just bounces for infinity, because that's really not enough to make water. But uh, one line of code here, and we're getting that something that's sort of, it's bouncy. It's a bit like water. OK. So on to drag. Why do I want drag? Let's look at this guy. So this is where I've got that, that buoyancy vector going right up. But it shoots in from the side. It bounces off. Uh, there's, there's nothing slowing it down. It's as if the water were completely ephemeral, and there's nothing there that it hit that slowed it. So I want to make uh, the water sort of push back on this object. So I want the opposite of the velocity. I want the opposite of a vector. And that is, you get that by multiplying a vector by negative 1. And now it is a journey, same distance, in the opposite direction. So if I know that my object is going into the water, it's coming along sideways, and it has a velocity of a certain amount, and I apply a force that is the in that same direction as the velocity, but times negative 1, it's going to go the other direction. So this is the new uh, purple or fuchsia drag line that we have uh, on here. So it hits the water. My buoyancy pushes it up, and my drag pushes it exactly in the opposite direction that the white uh, velocity arrow is going. And that is, I'm just rigid body adding a force of my velocity times negative 1 times however much I would like that water to affect it. So we're basically at two lines of code now, and we've got floating, and we've got some drag. So um, I was all excited. So now let's look at the underwater center. Why do we care about the underwater center of an object? So here you can see that I'm applying all the forces right in the middle of my, my box here. And as it uh, bounces up and down in the water, yeah, it's floating, and yes, there's some drag. But what's really unnatural about it is that left side should be pushed up first by the water and it should level out and that part that's sticking up above the water should fall down and this should level out uh, it doesn't because all my forces are right in the center i need to inspect this a little and learn learn a bit more about where where it's uh, where its corners are at so i need to know where are the corners of this object which of those corners are underwater and what is the center of those underwater corners um, for this, I'm going to use box colliders. And so in this example, I'm going to treat everything as if there's a rectangle around it. Um, uh, it's an estimation. So like this duck, I'm not going to deal with the fine details of its bill and its butt shape. I'm assuming it's all a, a, a rectangle. And you get pretty good results, uh, uh, at least for my uses. So I'm going to be looking at the box collider component, which is, again, just part of Unity. And it's telling me here, this box collider around a duck, I can inspect it in code. And it tells me that the duck is too long and uh, one wide and one tall. Um, and it gives me, I can get the coordinates easily by inspecting that. But the thing is, those coordinates it's giving me are in what's called local space. Those coordinates are local to the duck. So let's look at local space. So every object that has a box slider, every object in Unity carries with it its own coordinate system. So here we have the duck in its uh, representation of local space, its butt is always at about 2.3 there. Its tail is always about 2.3. No matter where I rotate or flip or move this duck, it carries with it its own x and y coordinates, and z in, in, in 3D. Um, and that is the local space. That is local to the duck. But if I want to know what part of that duck is underwater, under a different object, that water level 
I know it in world space. I don't know it in, in relation to the in duck space, in its local space. Um, so of course, Unity has uh, a nice simple method to transform between spaces. So on the duck, every, every object has a transform object, and that transform has a method called transform point. So I can give it a space in the duck space, in the local duck butt coordinates of 2.300. And I say, all right, if the duck butt is at 2.3, what is it in world space? Transform point, and what I get back is, currently your duck butt is at negative one, one. So I've figured out where all these coordinates are in world space, and now I can compare them to my water level. And here in this example, I see that one of them is above the water. So if I were just calculating the average of all of the points of this duck, that would be the center, and that would be where I would apply my forces, but that is not the portion of the duct that's underwater. I ignore the one that's above, I've got my new center, and now I can apply my forces there. So now in this example, it's a bit wobbly, but uh, my blue uh, buoyancy uh, force is adjusting to whatever the set current center of this, this rectangle is underwater. Um, and it wobbles a bit, and, but, but it's leveled out. So. We've got floating, we've got dragging, and we've got underwater center. Um, now I would like to uh, figure out the surface area and, and, and take account for that in some way. So what, why, why would I want to do that? Here's an example of two objects that are underwater. They've got all the forces so far being applied to them. Something still unnatural about this. The one on the left uh, doesn't have uh, as much surface area pushing up against the water as it's going, and the one on the right has a large, a wide area, it has to displace a lot of water, it should be moving slower. They shouldn't be moving up at the same pace. Um, but how do I account for the, the surface area uh, variance in the direction of movement? So here's a, to simplify the diagram, again, the white velocity is going up, and my red drag is pushing down, but it's just pushing down at one point in the center. What I want to do is to look out at a perpendicular line above this box, and then raycast back down along that line, and see if I hit my object in there, and if I did, then I push back. So in this example, the leftmost and the rightmost arrows of my scanning didn't hit my object. If my object were longer, it would hit it, and there would be more drag. But it was short, and if it were shorter, only the inner ones would hit it. So um, the approach, and I have to do this, of course, in 3D. So uh, to perhaps give us a, another analogy, if you're holding a selfie stick out with a really large box fan on it, and in whatever direction you're going, that fan is blowing back at you. That's a system I'm trying to set up here so that um, I am creating this plane out in front of me that's looking back, ray casting back, to basically inspect the size by poking rays at it. Uh, so what I need to find then is this plane. I need to find two perpendicular lines in space that are at the end of my velocity vector, that are also at perpendicular at right angles to my velocity vector. So um, how do I find perpendicular lines? Um, this is, uh, uh, I want to show you one more really cool property of vectors. And so this is uh, a thing called a cross product. How many people are familiar with a cross product? Awesome. Why am I even talking? You don't know what a cross product is. All right, anyway, so you get a refresher because it's got one of the coolest mechanisms for remembering a mathematical operation that, that, that I know of, and it's the right hand rule. So the cross product, uh, written uh, a, there's a little cross there at x. It looks like it might be times or multiply, it's called cross. Um, so a cross product is if you take the cross of two vectors, the result will be a third vector, and that third vector will be perpendicular to both of those first two vectors. It's gonna be at a right angle. So the right hand rule to help you remember, if I cross my pointer finger as the first one, and uh, I invite you all to start pointing, it's a cool thing to do. Um, everybody's doing it, you look silly if you don't. Um, you take your pointer finger and you cross it with your middle finger, you get your thumb. And your thumb is at a right angle to both of these, unless you were really working hard to do something strange with your hands. And so, no matter how I turn my fingers, this relationship stands. No matter how I actually rotate my middle, the relationship between my middle and my pointer, I'm still going to get this perpendicular thumb to it. So this is a way to get perpendicular lines from a vector. But in the case where we were before, I only know one vector. 
I only know the direction of velocity uh, that my object is going in. So what am I supposed to cross it by to get that, that to figure out a new line? Um, so the weird thing is, well, if I point my finger out in my direction of velocity and I want to find out my thumb, where do I need to point my middle finger? As I've just shown, I can point it mostly anywhere, except for exactly in the same line as, as my pointer. But I can point it mostly anywhere. So if I cross my direction of motion, my velocity, with roughly anything, I'm going to get a perpendicular line. And so that's how I find the first of the two perpendicular lines that I need to find here, the purple one. So now that I have two lines, I've got my velocity, and I've got the one that I just found, I can cross those two, and I get that third perpendicular line. So it's really just a matter of two cross product operations, and I have found two new vectors that are uh, perpendicular both to each other and to my velocity. And what that means basically is I've found my plane out here in the direction of movement where I can uh, scan back at my object. So here is an example of that being set up. So the uh, new two perpendicular lines that I found are these purple lines uh, that are at the tip of the velocity vector. And you can see as the object bounces down and up, the purple always stays as a cross aligned right on it. And so that's going to give me the opportunity to traverse. Uh, this is just a really simple bit of code where it's just a nested loop where I'm traveling across in a grid, left to right, and then up to down, across my vectors that I've just discovered. Um, and then if I hit something ray casting back towards my object, then I push on it. This is what it looks like. So the object on the left, clearly it's hit by a lot fewer of the ray casts. Um, and, and the one on the right gets pushed back down a lot more. So we've got floating, dragging, underwater center, surface area, and now um, I would like to respect the waves on top of the water. Um, I want to see things like in my little animation here, floating them down, because that's a lot of the joy of, of water. That's what makes it cool. So um, one way, and the way I've done it for now, is absolutely incredibly simple and brute force compare the position of every corner of every object to every point in your entire water mesh and see which one is closest uh, to figure out whether uh, how uh, deep it is in the water and whether it should be floating or falling down onto the water. Um, and yay, that's actually really simple and it works. Problem is, is I have this little capture here, is it's super inefficient. Uh, the red number may be hard to see. It means I'm doing about three million point comparisons per second. Um, and that's going to drag things down. So um, on to the last big section of this is I need to do this much faster than I'm currently doing it. So um, we're getting into some speed tips. Um, a lot of this is uh, stuff that you'll have to find on your journey towards optimizing stuff. And so I don't want to get too specific about what I did to optimize this, because it probably won't apply to what you're doing. But I want to show you how one does optimize some things, where you could look to figure out why some of your stuff is slow. So, First one, uh, um, oh, and the, the deep profile. If you're not familiar with that, Unity's got a profiler window. It's going to tell you all sorts of magic stuff. There's another tick box on there for deep profiler. You go deeper, you learn even more, and you, you get all sorts of data from your scripts about what's taking up time, what's using memory. Um, please see that. That is where I find all of my problems. So compute fewer things. For example, I broke up my water into four pieces of water, and then I can compare each object. Which of these quads of water are you nearest and then only compare against the, uh, the vertices inside that particular piece of water, the closest one. That's sort of a really simple one. Uh, compute fewer things. Uh, a lot of you probably know this, but um, uh, so I said that a vector is a, a direction and a magnitude, the distance that it goes in that, and the magnitude. And if, say, you want to know how far that is, there's a nice method in Unity called uh, vector3.magnitude to say how long is this. You get a, a number, number back. Um, but it requires computing a square root, which is, uh, takes a little bit of computational muscle. Um, there is another method called, that will give you the square magnitude, which is the uh, same number, but squared. They just skipped doing that square root part. And so if you're just comparing the two distances between, between vectors, see which one's longer, you can just compare their, the square of each of their magnitudes, and you've saved yourself some computation. Um, I would say that a lot of these things like this, optimizing like this, if you're making something really fat, really small, you're prototyping, uh, don't, don't bother. 
uh, if you're doing something three million times a second, then maybe you should worry about it. But in general, don't get hung up on this. Don't ever tell someone they're stupid for using the magnitude when they should be using square magnitude. Um, but you may need it in a pinch if you start getting really fancy and, and trying to do a lot of things at once. OK, uh, garbage collection. Uh, this is when, uh, this is in C sharp, when you make a variable, uh, you don't delete it yourself. Uh, Unity, C sharp, keeps track of it, deletes it for you later. It's carrying, it's holding all your garbage for you. And so you've got to be aware that all sorts of things you do are creating this garbage, and it takes time to clean it out. Um, when you start getting uh, into doing things millions and millions of times a second, you will find that little things that weren't really causing you trouble before, that only made a tiny bit of garbage, that is really magnified. Um, one that really actually sort of surprised me was uh, accessing a mesh in Unity, reading the vertices out of there, just reading it, not copying it, not explicitly copying it, just looking at one of the items in there actually creates a whole copy of the mesh. Um, and so you need to uh, look in the deep profiler, say, what is using half a megabyte of memory every five seconds? Um, and you'll find things like that. And then you have to you know, make your own copies and, and work around some stuff like that. Even for each, that simple little loop um, does have a tiny, tiny little allocation. Again, generally don't worry about it. If you're really trying to optimize, you, you might have to. Um, OK, and just a few uh, threading tips with this. So. Um, uh, thread pools are nice. That's uh, if you just Google it if you want to do some threads. But um, w what's uh, interesting about threads in Unity, um, as it is right now, I know they're doing a lot of work, but um, there's a lot of Unity calls we can't use. So a lot of the examples I gave you just now, you can't actually use in a thread. You can't refer to the Unity body in a separate thread, or the rigid body in a separate thread. You can't make a raycast. Um, and uh, that, particularly that example where we took the duck and moved its but from local space to world space, that method for transforming a point is not available to you in a thread. But what if you want to do that in a thread? That's a great place to compare all my points. Um, uh, Unity does have some things to let you work around that. Um, this is for another lesson, but doing that transform is actually just multiplying a matrix by a point. And you don't even have to know what a matrix is necessarily to do this, because Unity will just give you Oh, you want to know what the matrix would be to do this? You don't want me to transform the duck butt from local space to world space. You just want to know what that matrix would be here. I'll give it to you in a variable. You take that variable, you move that into a thread, and then once you're in a thread, you can multiply that by a point, and you've done that same operation, but now you've done it threaded. So there's a number of tricks like that where you can take your data, uh, pre-compute some things so you have what you need to really do the hard computations and the, the, the uh, ones you'll be doing millions and millions of times in a thread. OK. so. In conclusion, um, vectors are direction and magnitude. Force, um, uh, force. Uh, this is how we're going to be talking. You talk to rigid bodies by giving them these vectors of force. Uh, it's easy to transform from spaces. Don't be afraid. There are a few other spaces out there you can read about. Screen space. Um, uh, you can handle this. Uh, vector three dot cross uh, cross products. That'll get you the perpendicular line. Right hand rule, pointer, middle, thumb, um, and use a deep profiler. Um, whenever you're <laughs> trying to figure out why things are slow. So uh, I'll finish with a little video of sort of the state of how this, uh, all this code sort of comes together, uh, things splashing in there. Um, I know this was a, uh, a bit of a, uh, a rushed 25 minute after lunch math lesson. Um, and counterintuitively, I'm actually really hoping right now a lot of you are thinking, oh, this guy's not that smart. I could do this. Because that's kind of what I really wanted to get across is that, yeah, some of this is not that hard. Um, and even if you really didn't remember, like, exactly, OK, I can transform. I don't remember the method. Um, I, I hope that some of you uh, will go forward and realize that um, feel safe dreaming bigger. And uh, don't be afraid to add some sort of world bending ideas to what you're doing. Push the wind, flip the gravity. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff, you can achieve some pretty cool effects uh, without a lot of math. Um, and the math that's there, it's very achievable. Uh, so thank you very much. If you want uh, you want to play with this stuff, this water, send me an email. I'll get you a, a, a asset store key code for the uh, uh, water volume advanced buoyancy uh, asset we've got there. Um, and for, oh, there you go. for further reading, I'll switch back to that. Uh, this guy actually wrote a really detailed article with a bit more math and some really cool water buoyancy stuff. So if you're just really interested in buoyancy, you can just Google gamma subject buoyancy, and there's some good stuff there. So that's it. Thank you.
Any questions? We have a couple of microphones there and there. Uh, would you recommend any good books for ma math for programmers, I guess? Isn't that the title of the book, Math for Programmers, actually? I'm trying to remember this. I don't even know. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, uh, depending on what you're interested in, um, the primers are like just something basic on, on linear algebra. Something that's got a good covering of some linear algebra and a bit of trigonometry will serve you well. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be too... A game-related book will make it more fun, but those ideas are sort of very pure and very applicable to this. So um, whatever you can find something that really speaks to you on linear algebra and trigonometry. What about physics? Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's that too. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, sorry, another, uh, okay. Just resources about optimization, mm -hmm. kind of up-to-date resources. Where would it be a good place to look? <sighs> These are good questions. Um, I mean, Unity's documentation has a whole lot of, you know, do's and don'ts. They're a little scattered around. They are. Yeah. Um, you're going to find various people's blogs. They're going to, people are going to go into, like I just did, I went into the parts that mattered to me on my little journey here. And you're going to find some other blogs that are like that. So, so nice. I don't know offhand a, a general good one. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.